Welcome to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast, where we help you in the LGBTQ plus community find a safe and affordable retirement place. Join Mark Goldstein as he interviews others who live in gay-friendly places around the globe. Learn about the climate, cost of living, healthcare, crime and safety, and more. Now, here's your host, Mark Goldstein. Have you ever wondered what it's like to retire in Amsterdam, the Netherlands? Well, today we're going to find out. Our special guest is Jeremy Bierbach. Jeremy is originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. After graduating from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. in 1996 with a bachelor's degree in linguistics, Jeremy worked as an IT specialist for several years. In 2001, Jeremy emigrated to the Netherlands, and in 2003, he changed his career direction and began studying law at the University of Amsterdam, where he earned a bachelor's degree in Dutch law in 2006 and a master's degree in constitutional and administrative law in 2007. Jeremy subsequently worked as a legal advisor through Avocado Legal, where he focused on immigration and European migration law. In January 2014, Jeremy joined, I'm going to mess this up, Franzen Advocaten and was yeah. sworn into the Dutch bar as an attorney. Did I do okay? Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> and in September 2015, he successfully defended his PhD thesis in European constitutional law at the University of Amsterdam. A commercial edition of his thesis, Frontiers of Equality in the Development of U.S. and EU Citizenship, was published in 2017 by Osser Press. He is a member of the Work Group for Legal Aid to Immigrants, WRV, and the Specialist Association of Migration Law Attorneys, SVMA. He also serves on the board member of the Stitching Transmotion, the nonprofit foundation behind the volunteer-run Trans Screen Amsterdam Transgender Film Festival. Wow. His specialty and focus of interest is invoking norms of international law, EU law in particular, as a source of protection for members of minority groups who are unrepresented or underrepresented in the democratic process in particular EU citizens, their non-EU citizen family members, and other non-EU citizen immigrants to the Netherlands, including British citizens as former EU citizens. He represented two non-EU citizens, PNS, and challenging the Dutch state law on the laws providing for a fine to be imposed on immigrants who do not pass the civic integration exam. The underlying questions of EU law were ultimately referred to and decided by the Court of Justice in the Euro European Union in 2015, establishing important limits on the extent of which immigrants can be penalized without a complete examination of their personal circumstances and needs. Well, Jeremy, that's quite a bio. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. We appreciate you. And tell us your story. Tell us why you chose Amsterdam as a city in the Netherlands and what made you make the move from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Oh, just... So, yeah, I just, I, it, Amsterdam is just a place, it's a magical city. And I literally fell in love with it the very first time I ever came here. I was 19 years old. And I was on my way to Munich, where I was going to start my junior year abroad at the University of Munich. I flew KLM. And so I had a layover in Amsterdam with KLM. And it was like an eight-hour layover. So I just said, well, I'll, I'll go check out the center of the city. And got on a train, which got me to Amsterdam Central Station in 15 minutes. And I just walked out. And uh, and I walked down. The, I, just, I just walked a few blocks. And I just... I don't know. I was just very impressed with it. There's something, there's some, I, there, there's something very beautiful. There's something very, people often describe the look of the Netherlands as being like Legoland. That's, there's this, especially, especially Amsterdam. There's this very sort of picturesque, um, 
these picturesque facades of buildings all lined up sort of identically and canals and, and, and bicycle paths. And I was just already fascinated. And because um, I studied German as part of my degree, and that's why I was studying in Germany, I was a German mainer. Um, you know, I was walking down the street and I was like looking at storefronts and I was like, I can already read this. If you speak German, you can already read Dutch. I could even, even read newspaper headlines. And I was like, I picked the wrong country to go to. <laughs> and so then I got on my plane and like to Munich and arrived there that night, but it was already sort of like, ah, uh. and I couldn't stop thinking about Amsterdam. And wow. luckily because I was studying linguistics and I was in the linguistics faculty at the university of Munich, I first thing I did, one of the first classes I enrolled for was a, was a Dutch course Dutch. at the, at the university of Munich taught in German. But I mean, when you speak, like, like I said, when you speak German, Dutch is really easy to learn. And I'd had it since junior high. Dutch is, I mean, German's more difficult. German's more complicated. It's sort of like if you learn Latin first and then step down to Spanish, something like that. Right. I mean, it's a bit of an extreme example, but so I just, I just made it my life goal. And during that year that I lived in Germany, I came to Amsterdam at least two or three more times. Went also across the border to Maastricht. That was about the one, one time made it like a sort of weekend trip from Munich to get as close to the Netherlands as I could. And that was, that was in Maastricht in the South. Another very beautiful city, very different, but I see. So yeah, I just, I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with, I fell in love with the culture. I fell in love with, I don't know, but I, I, but I fell in love with what I like to say is I, I fell in love with the infrastructure more than anything else. It was really just seeing how things can be so well planned out to be human size, to be so welcoming just just by the very architecture of a place i often like to say if if some aliens took over the earth and then they wanted to create a truly complete zoo of all the animal species on earth for their own entertainment the habitat for homo sapiens would look like amsterdam hmm that's what that's what i love good, about it it's sort analogy. of it's sort of like everything it's sort of natural artificial it's sort of like, okay, imagine these alien anthropologists looking, or these alien zoologists looking at human beings and being like, okay, well, we know they come from Africa. We know they come from the savannah. They like flat grasslands. They, okay, so we'll make a city that's flat and not too many mountains or anything like that. We'll make it. There's plenty of, there's pl plenty of water everywhere, parks to walk in, that they can ride their bicycles everywhere. And then, okay, then the animals in this habitat will be pretty happy. That's what I think of Amsterdam as. Awesome. Tell us geographically, where is Amsterdam located within the Netherlands? And tell us where is exactly the Netherlands in the EU? Well, I mean, I'll start with where the Netherlands is. There's the really famous quote from Napoleon, who, who described the Netherlands as little more than the silt that, that, that is dumped out by our rivers. That is like, geographically, that is an accurate description of the Netherlands. The, the Netherlands is largely the Rhine River Delta. So if you have the Rhine, which rises in, in Switzerland, I believe, and then you have the Meuse, which rises in France, and they they join together around the Meuse comes up past Maastricht and the Rhine comes in you know, from, from Germany and they join. But you know, the nature of the geography of the Netherlands it is 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 it is a delta. It's sort of like it's sort of it's sort of no different than say like the, the delta of the Mississippi in Louisiana or or, or Bangladesh for that matter. So it was, so it's most of the country is very flat because it's not characterized by mountains that were formed in prehistoric times. It's, it's very sandy, very flood prone. So it's, it's at the northwest corner of Europe, sort of bordered by Belgium to the south and, and Germany to the, to the east. And then a short, about eight hour, eight hour boat ride across the North Sea to England. And that's the, that's the location of the Netherlands. And where's the location of Amsterdam in the Netherlands? It's in the, it's in the northwest as well of the Netherlands. It's it's definitely, it's definitely situated in what is known as the the north of the Netherlands, but not the far north. And it's situated in the west of the Netherlands, which is the urbanized part of the Netherlands. The Netherlands really has almost two equally divided areas of population. Okay. Total population is about eighteen million people, but about half of that population lives in the heavily urbanized Western area called the Randstad. So Amsterdam, 
Rotterdam, The Hague, and Utrecht make up a circular metropolitan area called Edge. Randstad means literally edge city. It's a sort of donut shaped area of urban development. And then the middle is what's called the Green Heart. The middle is still like farms. But the idea of the Randstad. The Randstad is, Amsterdam itself is not, a, Amsterdam is the biggest city in the Netherlands, but it's still not a big city by American standards. It's only about 850,000 people in population. But if you take the entire Randstad, then you're then you're looking at like 8 million people or 9 million people. So the entire Randstad can actually be compared to New York City in a lot of ways. I can say that. Same same kind of number of people, same, same kind of dense public transit networking. Like there's a train system which is actually in a sense, comparable to the subway system in New York, just like you can get from the Bronx to Brighton Beach if you really want to. Well, you know you're in New York. Yeah, I've only to take about an hour and a half. Well, I know know the movie The Warriors. That's that's what I always think of. I always think of that. that. Yeah, that's a classic movie. But yeah, the the, the Randstad is like that as well. Like for, for me in Amsterdam... Getting anywhere in that in that urbanized area will take me no long from door to door no longer than an hour and a half by public transit. So what's the um, climate like? So if you're in the northwest, I'm thinking cold winters and kind of dark winters and Yeah. Northwest of Europe. If you draw everywhere in everywhere in Europe is north of where what almost almost everything in in the United States. If you draw if you draw a line directly across the globe, where am uh, I? Amsterdam. Amsterdam is roughly between Vancouver and the tail of Alaska. Okay, that's our so, that's our latitude. Whereas I mean, Madrid, which we think of as warm, we think of as like warm Southern Europe, that's the same latitude as New York City. So there, okay, I could see that. Yeah, Madrid and Spain, because yeah, Madrid gets cold in the winter and warm in the summer and. Yeah, I could yeah, it doesn't. It does, but it doesn't get as cold in New York City. What does keep? What keeps Europe warm for now until ta- until climate change starts changing that is the Gulf Stream. So the only reason we don't have the act- the only reason we're not quite as cold as somebody who would be in the middle of British Columbia would be is because there's this there's this stream of warm water pumped up from the Caribbean toward toward northern Europe, which keeps it temperate here. Yeah. But the northern latitude, there's one thing you can't do. There's one thing that no stream of warm ocean water can fix, and that's that we're simply astronomically at a at a high latitude. And it means that the days in the winter are very short. The days of light are less than eight hours. Sun goes up around nine. And, you know, in December, in December mid mid December, sun goes up around maybe nine nine fifteen. Goes down again at four thirty p.m. Wow, Pitch it black goes up at feet. nine o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I can't even imagine that. So you get up in darkness, and you, you go, go to work to... in darkness, and you come home from work in darkness. But in the in the summertime, it's the opposite. So and it's, then it's, it's glorious. Light. It's light almost all day long, right? Mm-hmm. It's light mm-hmm. until around June twenty first, around the summer solstice. You can be out in the park, and you can be like, "Oh, gee, what time is it? It feels like seven. Like, oh, it's ten thirty. So it's still sunny at ten thirty at night. In the yeah, summer? it's still sunny at ten thirty at night, and then wow. the sun will really set by eleven thirty. No wonder why people um, eat dinner late. <laughs> I guess that's more that's more Spain thing here. Yeah. You know, in Spain, people eat dinner late. They well, they sleep in the morning because it's so hot. Yeah, because it's so hot during the day. Okay, so is living in an LGBTQ community important to you? Yeah. And if so. Is there such a thing in Amsterdam, or is it pretty integrated? Yeah, well, Amsterdam historically was known as the gay capital of Europe, or some people said the gay capital of the world. I don't think, and I don't think everyone said it was the gay capital of the world, but it was, you know, it used to be said it was the gay capital of Europe. So it developed in the Netherlands because of the 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 famous tradition of tolerance in the Netherlands, which basically grew out of the entire history of the Netherlands. The great majority of the history of the Netherlands is a history of religious conflict. All the religious wars that split Europe for for years and years and years, starting from the 1600s, always the dividing line went straight through the went straight through the Netherlands. The Treaty of Utrecht, where it was finally settled that okay, this part of Europe is going to be Protestant and this part of Europe is going to be Catholic. 
literally went through the city of Utrecht, which is about 30 miles south of Amsterdam. And so even to this day, everywhere north of that line in the Netherlands is traditionally overwhelming, pro- overwhelmingly Protestant. And everywhere south of that line is traditionally overwhelmingly Catholic. Roman Catholic, which creates still a visible difference in the, in the culture. This is a tiny country. We're, we're a country the size of, I don't know, New Jersey or something like that. So but, what, what's, more, what's more tolerant? And I hate that word. Well, tolerant. well what's more to- the, re- the reason for tolerant, the, well, the reason why I start off with that that tradition, that that history of like religious conflict, was because a lot of the ways that the because for people live together in one small country, the notion of tolerance originally developed as a sort of like, okay, well, you you stay over there and you do your thing, and I'll stay over here and we'll do my, I'll do our thing, and we won't bother each other. It was not a, it was not a very loving concept. Let's put it this way: it was sort of like a. It's sort of like a ceasefire concept, especially in areas where there were both Protestants and, and Catholics living in the same city. There were some areas where they were mixed. They lived very segregated lives, very segregated lives. If you were Protestant, you your family, your entire family was Protestant. You went to Protestant schools. Your your parents read a Protestant newspaper. They voted voted for a Protestant political party. You went to the baker. That was the Protestant, not the baker across the street that was Catholic. And if you were Catholic, it was the other way around. And so the Netherlands was the Netherlands was was good at whatever there was of Dutch culture. It was it was a lot of it was about this live and let live concept. And that also then made it fertile ground for for a sort of vibrant gay culture to develop in the sixties and seventies. Of course, in the sixties were a decade of upheaval. And change in a lot of ways, and but 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 gay culture was one of the things that flourished, especially in the sixties. But even before that, there were there were always sort of more than other places in Europe. It was easier to live a sort of don't ask, don't tell mm. gay life. The oldest gay bar in Amsterdam, which is still open or reopen, I should say it. I can look this up. Is I think almost a hundred years old now. Since nineteen twenty seven. The oldest gay bar in Amsterdam opened in 1927. It's called it Mantje. It was run by a butch lesbian named Bet Bier, who was sort of famous as being sort of like very tough butch, leather jacket wearing, maybe motorcycle driving lesbian. And she, it was a sort of open secret that this bar was a gay bar. And there were certain signals, but this was still a time of, this was still a time of great repression. Mm-hmm. So there was an owl which is still there, you can see is inside the door with, where, where the eyes would light up. The owl was, was also a lamp. She would flip a switch if the cops were at the door. And then all the all the men who were dancing with men and all the women who were dancing with women would switch partners switch. really fast <laughs> to, uh, to, to pair up man-woman when, when the cops came in. And then Bet would say, well, what are you bothering me for? <laughs> and apparently, so that bar, well, that bar actually sort of, Closed when Bet died, maybe in the fifties or some something like that, or nineteen eighty three. Apparently, I'm looking at the history now on the internet, and apparently, though her family didn't really care to reopen it, and it actually just literally remained closed like a vault for for almost yeah, for twenty. I'm looking at the history now, nineteen eighty three. From nineteen eighty three until two thousand eight, it was just closed like a vault, and then two thousand eight, it was reopened, but it was reopened as a sort of living museum like a museum yeah it's a neat place to go to so what they did was they took they sort of re revived the decor that had been in there at the time they they opened up the vault because at the time they opened up the vault there were all these papers and posters and scraps of paper and people's phone numbers pinned to the wall and they took all of those original papers out and they went to the amsterdam municipal museum and they made they made a really high quality scan of all that and they made wallpaper out of it so, cool. so you see, see, so you see a replica on the walls of all the stuff that was, yeah, all the stuff that was on all the, all the flyers for, for sex workers, all the, all the, all the numbers that people wrote on a, on a notepad, wow. down, the, their, their contact info for the dates they made there. So do you live in like an LGBTQ neighborhood, like a gayborhood? or? That doesn't exist it here. It doesn't that, exist. That, no. That it's so free exist. and open that it doesn't matter. It's that, and it's also that it's such. There's a perpetual housing shortage in Amsterdam, so even if there were, even if there were a, a, gay a neighborhood, neighborhood, you couldn't get in you, there. Yeah, you just it's you 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 take what you get. That's that's how it works with housing in Amsterdam. You you look and look, and you you can't be too picky. You can't say I well, definitely want to live in that neighborhood. 
we'll get um, to that as well. So, yeah, I, I'd like to know about that too. Speaking of that, we might as well go into that now. Um, what is it like or how much would you pay for to buy a house in Amsterdam or a condo? And what is it like a rental cost? And how about utilities? We can talk about that as well. Okay, that's a good question. Well, everything, almost everything you're going to be buying or renting in Amsterdam is, I suppose, what you would call, or if you're buying, is what Americans would call a condo, meaning like an actual freestanding house. Buying an actual freestanding house Amsterdam doesn't knows. exist. Not that much of it. Yeah, I mean, there would be, at most, it would be row houses. Or, 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 or in some more outer neighborhoods, there'll be like like duplex houses where you could buy one half of that. That's about as much actual house, as much freestanding house as you can find here. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a city of apartments. It's a city mm-hmm. of apartments and you would you'd buy an apartment. So you could buy a studio apartment, a studio apartment in central Amsterdam. But what I mean by central Amsterdam is what we call inside the ring. That's That's generally agreed agreed on on as what is the most sort of desirable area of Amsterdam to live is anywhere inside the ring. I mean, that, I mean, that's more than a neighborhood. Of course, that's, that's like 60 neighborhoods, but right. So you can, that is what you can choose to do, but yeah, inside the ring, a studio apartment, we're talking maybe like 400 square meters or 400 square feet. Sorry, I'm doing the conversion in my mm-hmm. head. Square meters to square feet is about a factor of 10. Yeah. So if you want a modest studio apartment for with 400 square feet, where you ideally be living as a single person or living as a very in love couple to live in such a cozy, small space. Very cozy. Yeah, very cozy in love couple. That will run you at least 370K. 370,000 uh, euros to buy that. It's not it's not cheap. No, it's not cheap. By any means. How about like a, what do you think a two bedroom? Two would bedroom, go for? 550K, 600K. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's like US prices. Well, pretty much. On, yeah. add, add, add 10% for the conversion from uh, dollars to, right, to euros. Right, okay. So, you know, so 600 Zero K is up. 660 US K. Yeah, and, uh, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. How about rentals? Like the rental market, if if you wanted to rent an apartment. If you wanted to rent a two-bedroom apartment, you'd be looking at 2,000, 2,300, 2,300 a month, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, uh, it's, studio, it sounds maybe like 1,200, 1,300. It's pretty much the same as here. I mean, and... Phoenix is, has increased in value of real estate over the past year or so. But yeah, so those prices are pretty up there. And so I guess you get what you pay for. And Amsterdam is a, a desirable place. And it's hard to get. Let's talk about how do people get apartments? I mean, you're saying the space is limited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just have to. Be lucky. Fight and wait and get lucky and and hear about something, yeah. And do you pay. own yours? Do you own yours? I own a I own a studio apartment, which is really of all the ironies in the world. I bought I bought a studio apartment right after I graduated from law school. The I had a failed marriage behind me, and all the other dating and relationships I had weren't working out. And I was thirty two years old. I said, and "That's it. I'm just gonna be single for the rest of my life. I'm just gonna get my little." get my little piece of real estate ground floor apartment for me and my cat so that I can put in a cat door and he can go outside. Mm-hmm. And the irony is as soon as I established my, my, my happiness, my little, my little studio apartment, literally six weeks after, after I took possession of that apartment, I met my current husband who I've now been together with for 16 years, married to <laughs> for almost six years. Wow. And, you know, but it was way too small for us both to live in. So, I mean, I live by, we, we had a cross town relationship for six years until we finally moved in. And then since then I've been renting it out to various friends of mine. So um, what's, what type of place are you living in now? Like how much, how big? We live in a we live in a rental apartment. Which we live in we live in a he he got really lucky, and it, it is one of the things where you know you it, he just got he just got fabulously lucky, and he heard about 
his mom was standing at the bus stop and literally was chatting with some lady. And she said, oh, well, I work for this real estate company. We happen to have this apartment that's opening up. The people are moving out of, does he want to take a look? And that was also a few months into our relationship that he really lucked out and got a place about, about 580 square feet, one bedroom. But, you know, it's about the minimum that we need to right. not be bumping cool. elbows too much. Yeah. That's great. Okay. How about utilities? Are they expensive? Like I electric, know, yes. gas? Because of the war. Okay. Of the war. Yeah. The Netherlands, the Netherlands, Europe made a mistake by becoming far too dependent on Russian gas. For years, the Netherlands itself was, was was a producer of gas as well. The Netherlands became fabulously wealthy by discovering a big bubble of natural gas under the North Sea in the 70s and also in under under the northern part of the Netherlands around Colonia. So for a long time, gas, especially heating, was so cheap in the Netherlands because the Netherlands produced so much of its own. Now the Netherlands had to stop producing it because it's, it's, it's run out and also, in fact, the, the 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 pumping of gas in the northern Netherlands has caused earthquakes and has, has caused oh, actual boy. structural damages damage to people's houses. So Netherlands had to stop producing gas. But then you know, all of Europe, meanwhile, became overly optimistic that it was a really good idea to get more economically integrated with Russia. That if we bought gas and oil from Russia, that that would help encourage peace in Europe. But instead, it had the opposite effect of creating a dictator Putin who got them a little too over eager to take slices of neighboring countries in the former Soviet Union. So that's where we are. So ever since, ever since the war between ever since Russia invaded Ukraine and the sanctions on, on Russia have started, our, our gas bill has skyrocketed. So we have to be a little more careful with energy. Yeah. So what would you say is, what do you pay for a month for gas? Currently, I mean, I think it's. I, don't, I think it's going to be readjusted by our by our energy company. But I think currently it's like two hundred a month. Wow, that's a lot yeah. for us. For so square in any case, footage. yeah. In, in any case, a, now people, it's a it's a it's, it's a poorly it's a poorly insulated apartment. We, due to it being cheap rent, we've got a landlord who is not very motivated to do any upgrades or or make it more energy efficient. How about electric? Well, is that's that that's together. Our total electricity bill uh, okay. is, is two hundred. But I think. Oh. Okay. I don't know which. So that's uh, electric and gas. Yeah, I can actually. That's not too bad. I can look in my app and see what what part is what part is more. <laughs> yeah, <don't worry> about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's slightly depressing, but yeah, no. When we, I definitely, I definitely know if we, if we, if we upgrade, if we we're able to like move into move into a, a larger place and we probably will move outside the ring because now we really are now we're old enough that we really would actually like more space rather than more access to the central city but yeah we'll be putting solar panels on the roof yeah. and we'll be not all that there's a big push in the netherlands to get off of gas altogether so new housing developments are electric only um so and they have heat pumps Right. And so the idea is if you if you if you make, if you just get rid of the gas network when building when building new homes that'll motivate people to make use of more energy efficient options like heat pumps and, got it got um, it um induction so it's all turning into i'll miss i'll miss cooking on gas it'll be cooking on an induction uh on an induction stove but you know it's worth how about worth price the, of groceries is that expensive that's or? great price of groceries is great that's that's one thing that's that's one thing that's extremely affordable and extremely high quality it's food and food well food yeah exactly raw like produce you know, ingredients produce produce going out is way more is so is so the the price and the price of food is lower and the quality of food is higher when you buy it in the supermarket compared to the u.s mm -hmm. the netherlands is a major agricultural producer there's very high quality produce coming from the netherlands there's very high quality produce coming from the rest of the european union one of the pillars of the european union is subsidizing farmers to produce good quality products that might not be so lucrative for them so you have you have access to all the all the delicious things fresh mozzarella mm. from italy yeah cheeses from cheeses like, from france like i just wit witnessed <laughs> yeah, exactly i awesome. before i before we began this podcast i I, fin I polished off a caprese salad that my husband whipped up for me it was really delicious and it looked delicious mm -mm -mm. <laughs> so tell the audience is it difficult to meet friends or gay people in in amsterdam or is it pretty easy 
No, pretty easy. I mean, yeah, there's 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 a there's a large there's a large gay scene. I mean, it's different than it used to be. I mean, everything's changing. Of course, it has it has to do with generational changes. There was historically there were three commercial neighborhoods. I don't describe them as neighborhoods where people live because nobody would ever like live in one of those neighborhoods where where the gay bars clustered. In fact. I think it wouldn't have been really, none of them would have, been, would have been really nice places to live, to be honest. But there were places where there were, there were commercial entertainment districts where gay bars clustered. And so one of them was the Reguliusdvarstrat, one of the most difficult to pronounce names of a street. I'm not going to even non-dose try. Speakers. Yeah, people just call it, people who can't speak Dutch, they call it the gay street. And everyone knows what you're talking about. Reguliusdvarstrat mm-hmm. was, a, was a street that at its peak... Like when I first moved here in 2001, it had a huge cluster of gay bars. It was like, it was like the hive mind of gay bars. There were like seven in one in one narrow street, and they do mm-hmm. still sort of cluster in the middle. Uh, and it's a and it's and it's a trap. It's a it's a pedestrian only street. And so in the summertime, what's nicest about that little there's a there's a cluster of four gay bars that's left in the middle. In the summertime, it turns into a sort of permanent street party. On, on on weekends where where it's more you people just get their beer from it doesn't matter where you get your beer from you're just standing out on the street with everybody that's kind of nice the bars themselves are not much to write home about but so what, when i hear amsterdam i kind of equate it to like las vegas do they have like a red light district in amsterdam as well yep so so amsterdam got big as a as a as a harbor it's amsterdam actually is one of the youngest cities in in Europe, it didn't have much of an existence in the Middle Ages, for instance. Um, most of the really old cities in Europe, you know, go back as far to the Roman Empire or became big in the Middle Ages. But Amsterdam wasn't even the most important city in the Netherlands for a long time. The most important cities in in the in the Netherlands or the Low Countries, as sometimes they're described historically, because the Netherlands and Belgium were sort of one unit for for many years of their history, were Harlem. Uh, which is in between Amsterdam and the North Sea coast and Antwerp. Those were the those were the real medieval centers of of, of, of religion and commerce. And Amsterdam was a swamp. Amsterdam was a, was on a floodplain of the flood prone Amstel River. Hmm. And it wasn't until some local farmers and residents got together and banded together to dam the Amstel and tame it. Damn the Amstel. That, that it became habitable but it became a habitable area and that's and then and then what also superpowered the rise of amsterdam as a power was that it turned into a major trading center it turned into because it was kind of a new city then this is this is the magic of amsterdam because it was kind of a new city it, it attracted migration from a lot of places a lot of places in the rest of the Netherlands, a lot of places in the rest of Europe, people people started flocking to Amsterdam. It became a sort of place where you could make it. If you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere. Anywhere. It's no, it's no surprise that New York is New Amsterdam. There you New go. New York is founded on that Amsterdam spirit of being an entrepot, of being a place of trade, a place where you wouldn't be judged. You could anybody could come there, any religion, and so is this is this thriving trading that's, center that's awesome and tell us but about that also that also then where you get trade where you get sailors you get hookers and that's why the oldest part of amsterdam the part of amsterdam that was the first habited part the part that, that was the called old side out that is the heart of what's now the red light district that is the one of the oldest businesses not just the oldest profession in the world but it's the, pretty much the oldest business in amsterdam and also, when I think of Amsterdam, I think people say, oh, they have so many hash bars. Tell us a little bit about that. Does that still exist? Yeah, it still exists. But, you know, Amsterdam or the Netherlands is now a backwater compared to the rest of the world. Half of the United States has fully legalized weed. And I think even Germany just actually legalized weed, although they legalized it in a, in a weird way. There's not actually shops where you can get it. But you have to sort of grow your own or join a club of people growing their own. And in the Netherlands, which is famous for legal weed, it's still not actually legal. Hmm. It's still not actually legal. It's still actually on the books. It is still in the criminal code. 
that of course it's decriminalized it's always it's been decriminalized for a very long time you know i mean you'll you'll never get you'll never get jail time for having Position. less than an ounce of weed possessing less than an ounce of weed i mean it would be what's considered a non would be considered the equivalent of a misdemeanor but then it's there's also prosecution guidelines that say they won't actually prosecute private individuals for possession of, of, of personal amounts sort of this idea of we've got better things to do but how it works out again this goes back to the tradition of toleration in the netherlands it's tolerated so there's there's a marijuana industry that is tolerated and it grew out of like sort of youth cultural centers in the late 60s and late 70s that was a time of great upheavals in the culture and, and young people didn't really have anywhere to go they often had to live at home till the age of 28 until they could get their own place so they needed places to gather and so a lot of places were squatted a lot of empty buildings were squatted and and young people turned them into places where bands would play and people could hang out and drink beer but then it also evolved that a lot of these youth cultural centers which were called coffee shops people go to drink coffee there would end up being a sort of one corner of the space where there would always be a dealer sitting at a table selling selling hash and weed and it became institutionalized like a hash in that bar. Way. it came it came to be that then the cops and the public prosecutor's office came to inventorize which places had their little house dealer and they said okay they would they would go there and be like okay we know about you do your thing Stick to the rules. Don't sell to anybody under 18. Don't sell any other kind of, don't sell hard drugs. Don't sell anything that's harder than, than weed or hash. Mm -hmm. Don't sell any extracts of weed or hash. Don't, don't sell more than a couple grams per person per transaction, something like that. And then we'll leave you alone. If you, if you, if you, if you toe the line, we'll leave you alone. So that's what then evolved into what's called a coffee shop. So a place that calls itself a coffee shop. And also they're not allowed to like, they're not allowed to like expressly advertise that they sell weed there. So right. if it says coffee it's shop coffee. in English on the, yeah, then you know what it means. It doesn't mean they sell coffee there. They're not allowed <laughs> to put a, they're not allowed to put a marijuana right. leaf on the, on the, on the, on the front to make it that obvious. But if it's called a coffee shop, that's what it means. That's the right. place you then don't you go, go to drink there. coffee. In fact, the coffee is notoriously <laughs> bad in all those places. Notoriously that's, bad. That's funny. They'll give you, right. you know, if you really have to ask for a coffee at one of those places, they'll give you like a senseo or something like that. It's some, it's some sort of dishwater coffee. So if if I move to Amsterdam, would I have to speak Dutch? Or I recommend do, you don't have to. Do people don't speak have English? To. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is the Netherlands, like the, the Netherlands is up there with the Scandinavian countries as being the parts of Europe, I mean, aside from, of course, England, where or the the non-native speaking parts the non-native english speaking parts of europe where fluency in english is the highest level because like the netherlands like sweden like denmark these are all countries that realize that nobody's going to learn their language they have a consciousness of them of, of not speaking a language that's spoken by that many people in the world and so the educational system is very much oriented toward making sure that kids making sure that dutch kids learn to speak other languages from an early age and historically, it used to be in the Dutch educational system that it was expected of an educated Dutch person to speak, to be able to speak English, English. German, and French. Wow. It used to be common in the, in, the, in the upper levels of schools that you weren't, you weren't considered to be properly educated, educated unless you spoke four languages. But German and French have fallen by the wayside. French, I'm, I'm surprised because so in, close. Yeah, French, French has lost in relevance in, in, on the world scene. German... Any Dutch speaker can can speak good enough German. Right. You know, any, it's close. Any, any, Dutch, any Dutch speaker without ever having taken German lessons can sort of speak fake German. And so that's left it that the only major foreign language that anybody really studies here is English. English. And so that means that all Dutch people speak, you know, varying degrees of good English. Definitely enough to to get the tra get business done. It's always mm -hmm. about getting. It's always about getting that. It's always about getting that transaction done. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the Dutch are nothing if if about business and trade, and so anybody you know working a cash register, even if they're not highly educated, they will they'll speak enough English to do the transaction. They won't be bothered by the fact that you're not conducting the transaction in Dutch. But what I do say to my clients, I really from day one I say, go out of your way to make an effort to learn Dutch. Do it. I, I agree. You will not absorb it. I this, agree. Especially and in you're Amsterdam, you're missing you're missing so much too. Yeah, of part yeah, of the especially culture. Especially in Amsterdam. 
You will not absorb it by osmosis. Absolutely not. You will not. The, there will never be a situation where you'll be forced to speak Dutch, where, you, where it'll be sink or swim. Never. Right. You really have to go out of your way. You have to pay somebody. You have to, you have to pay a teacher. You have to pay a school. Enroll in classes. Make an effort. Because it makes a difference in your life. It makes a real difference in your life. It's a difference between living life in black and white and, li and living it in color, to use a sort of Wizard of Oz metaphor. And I kind of think that if you make an attempt speaking Dutch and you're not doing so well, that somebody might, in a, in a business, start speaking English to you. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to even learn Dutch mm -hmm. because you want to really speak Dutch, but you're having trouble. So. Yeah, and you have to be patient. You have to. You have to just take that on. You have to like. You have to. You'll. You will have to push. You will have to say, "I'm really sorry. I'm trying to speak Dutch to you. Please speak Dutch back to me." And some some people will get it. Some people don't. And vowels. I've, are you different. know, I've cut off. I've cut off friends, or not. They weren't maybe, maybe friends, but there are people who I sort of just made a decision not to become friends with because they didn't respect that I wanted to speak Dutch with them. You get a lot of you get a lot of Dutch people who think it's really nice and fun and exotic to have international friends. And they like to speak their English. They like to right. show off their English. And they sort of, there's something in there. There's something, either either it's like they want to show off their English or there's something in their brain that makes them out of a feeling of sympathy or feeling sorry for you. Oh, you're trying so hard to speak Dutch, but I don't want to make it harder for you. Right. I'm just going to switch back to speaking English. And those are the kind of people, I, if, they, if they kept doing that, I would say, I don't think yeah. it's going to work out as a friendship. I got you. I, I understand. I totally understand because you're living in the country you should learn the language of the country and yeah i'm kind of like that's a how did you so you were fluent when you pretty much got there right i was fluent well, when i got were, here i was i was a freak yeah i mean i was fluent i was i was fluent in written dutch i mean i was fluent in dutch as a written language i read a lot of dutch newspapers in between my year in germany and going back to the u.s so I went back to the U.S. I graduated. I had my final year at Georgetown, left D.C. in 1996 to move to the West Coast to chase the dot-com boom, the first one. And But I always, always kept reading Dutch newspapers. And luckily for the Internet coming up, that meant that I could read things on the Internet. I could practice my Dutch online. I even had a co-worker who was Dutch, funnily enough, wow. at, at, at the last place I worked in San Francisco. And he and I would... would Talk. enormously annoy our co-workers all the time by speaking Dutch with each other. <laughs> and, and then when that was, that was a great job by the way, it was a great company that I worked at. But when we went, you know, when we went bust because of the whole industry going bust at the end of the year 2000, that's when I decided I, I don't necessarily have to stay in the tech industry in, in San Francisco. I'm going to follow my dream and I'm going to move to Amsterdam. And that's why I made the move at the beginning of 2001. And George W. Bush getting elected was also another push I didn't want to stick around for that. Gotcha. Gotcha. So tell us a little bit about the arts and culture scene in Amsterdam. It's huge. I mean, I have a lot of one, one part of my, of my law practice is helping people get artist visas. And so I have a large, I have a large number of clients who are, they usually graduate from an, from an art institute in Amsterdam. There are, there are several, there's the, there's the, there's a major visual arts institute called the Rietveld Institute and a graduate program called Sandberg Institute. There's a performing arts, there's a performing arts institute here, and there is a fashion design institute here as well, all in Amsterdam. Mm. And yeah, Amsterdam is pretty major city for culture, I mm, think. Yeah, and there's lots of there's lots of art spaces. I mean, so you have galleries. World class. Yeah, I mean, it's at the top you have the world class museums of the Rijksmuseum, the Rijksmuseum, which houses all the all the most famous Dutch masters, the most famous of which is the Night Watch by Rembrandt. You have the wow. Stedelijk Museum, which is a major modern art museum, which also has a lot of a lot of very captivating uh, exhibitions. You have the Photography Museum, the Foam Museum. There's just so many places. When you live here, you can pay. 65 euros a year or off the top of my head something about that for what's called a museum card and it gives you unlimited free access to all the all the public museums in the that's netherlands cool. so it's only wow, with the exception cool. of a few pri very privately run museums i never get my money out of it i, I know that i know that i'm i'm subsidizing my husband and i are definitely subsidizing all the museums in the netherlands by spending together 120 or 130 a year when we would have saved money by actually 
just paying entry the few times that we go. So but it's, it's a it's good cause. Good. It's a good but cause. But it's nice. Yeah, it's nice to know that you can just walk into a place whenever right. you want. Right. How about live theater? Live theater. There's live theater. I mean, there's even the, there's even now a theater which has only English language productions called the International Theater Amsterdam. Wow. On, on Light Supply. It used to be called the, the City Theater of Amsterdam, but then two years ago it was converted to the to the ITA, International Theater of Amsterdam. So all the productions there are are not Dutch language. I mean, most most of theater, most of live theater is still Dutch language, though. Okay. That is something to, to that is something to recall. That but even if even if Dutch people do speak fluent English, that doesn't mean that they necessarily want to seek out all their entertainment in English. In English. They don't want to have to they don't want to have to they don't they don't want to have to like read subtitles. They there, there is a huge well maybe Dutch film somewhat, but I mean there's yeah, there's a huge Dutch Dutch language theater scene. I know this because my husband worked on worked for the major musical musical production company in the Netherlands for many years and he still does still does a lot of jobs. He works as a costume designer. And the big the big money makers in the theater world are Dutch language musicals. They're usually typically translations of uh, of musicals from the English speaking world. So The Bodyguard in Dutch, Mamma Mia in Dutch. Wow. But those are huge money spinners. Because like I said, even though the Dutch people do speak fluent English, you know, if they want if they want an experience of going out and being entertained, then, then you know, they'd rather have it be in Dutch, of course. How about how about the restaurant scene? Are you a foodie? You like to eat? Uh, yeah. Out? Do you go out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like we love to go, we love to go out. I mean, it's too much to eat. Patting my patting my uh, ample belly right now as I say that. Although I have to admit, my husband and I were sort of more we're sort of more middle brow eaters. We like to we like to go out and get good burgers. There's a really good burger scene here. That's a real thing. That's 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 come up in the last ten years. Gourmet burgers. Wow. And of course, another we're famous for fries here, French fries. Are you? Which oh, originate, okay. yeah, originated in Belgium. The whole, the whole Low Countries. That's that's one of the culinary areas of excellence. Is the idea of, of of French fries or Belgian fries or Flemish fries, as they're called, which are thick and they're they're fried. They're first blanched. the The trick is to first blanch them, to first like cook them, cook them briefly, and then. And then fry them again, and that creates this perfectly crispy jacket on the fry with a perfectly sort of mashed potato mm, inside. Sounds so good. Mm-hmm. Do you guys do cheeseburgers? Or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or is that a so U.S. The, so thing? the gourmet burger scene, yeah, they'll be like, yeah, exactly. You, you hit it with cheese and bacon and whatever. Mm. Mm, so sounds really that's good. good. That's good. But it's, you know, but it's expensive. I mean, even that's the thing. I said groceries are cheap when you go to the supermarket. But dining but is expensive. Dining is expensive and because because labor is expensive, rightly so. Um, you don't have, you know, uh, people get paid living wages. Somebody can have a full-time job, you know, working at a restaurant. And Unlike the U.S. Live, where they, they the don't pay. They're not, they're not struggling. They don't pay. Kids. U.S., they don't pay their waiter or waitress staff. So that's why they rely on tips. Yeah. Does Amsterdam accept tips like yes yeah it's it's, you do? it's it's yeah it's 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 the idea is but it's 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 not seen as tipping is not seen as an obligation in order to make it possible for this person to actually live it's seen as a as a, as a sign of appreciation and so it's you round up so the bill is 1850 you say make it 20 and and tipping is always done here as it has to be done as a personal gesture it would be considered actually to be an insult to just leave money behind on a table and walk away. So, so there's no such thing as you, they're not looking for like a 20%. No, because we, if we don't leave 20%, mm-hmm. you're like, Oh, something's yeah. really wrong something's either really with wrong. you or the service. Yeah. So, so no, that's not expected. It's always, so it's not expected. It's yeah. always appreciated. Always appreciate it. And even giving no tip is not seen as any sort of message. If it's not, it's not taken badly. It's not like the, it's not like the waiter would chase after you and be like, did I do something wrong? I prefer it that way. Are there like also five star restaurants? I'm oh, sure yeah. they're really good. Michelin yeah, there's, rated. there's a bunch of Michelin restaurants. We've only been to, we've only ever been to, oh, I've been to, I've been to another one. Oh, I've been to a really nice seafood restaurant as a Michelin star. 
And, and we went to there's the, the the best Japanese what what's up, what a lot of Japanese people say is the best Japanese restaurant in Europe hmm. is in Amsterdam. That's a Michelin starred restaurant. That's a kaiseki, meaning like Japanese gourmet style restaurant at the Okura Hotel, which is a Japanese run hotel. We've been there tw- twice, three times. And that's always an amazing experience. Nice, nice. Okay, let's let's go on to public transportation. Tell us, do they have a subway system, buses, what kind of, how could I get around Amsterdam? Yeah, there's a subway system, which is sort of, you know, it, it serves as sort of spine of the, of the city. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it doesn't get you everywhere, but a new line was opened up a few years ago, the North South line, but you, you always, you can jump on, if, if, if the subway doesn't get you all the way to your destination, then you jump on a tram. So there's three there's three forms of public transport. There's there's subways, there's trams, which are streetcars. They provide a little more dense network service, and then there's finally buses. And so you can always you can always get from A to B, usually in a maximum of two modes of transport. Is is like the town, or is everything uh, walkable? Like if I wanted to go to the market. Could I walk to the market or if I want to go to the pharmacy? Could inside I walk the, to the inside pharmacy? Inside the ring, yeah, inside in the, the ring. ring, most of the neighborhoods are dense and walkable enough that you can walk to a supermarket. Supermarkets are the major, the, the largest supermarket chain is Albert Hein. They're, they're actually, oddly enough, they're, I mean, they're, they're owned by the multinational conglomerate A Hold, which start, grew out of it, which also owns. I think like Giant in the United States. Oh wow! It's a major East Coast grocery store chain. That's actually owned by that same company, which grew out of uh, the Netherlands. So Albert Heijn is they've got the near monopoly on on supermarkets. They've they've got one in every neighborhood, and then there's other supermarket chains called Jumbo, and then Dirk van den Broek is the disc, is the discount one. But the idea is when you live in a dense and walkable neighborhood, you've almost always got a supermarket within walking distance. And how about a pharmacy if I needed to pick up a prescription? Yes. Also that too. Dense and okay. Walkable. So all of that. So post office, yeah. pretty much everything is. Yeah. Well, post offices aren't what they used to be. The, the, the postal no, system either. has been completely privatized and, and sort of destroyed. So, you know, actual post offices anymore. There's postal oh, really? services at little usually tobacco stores. Okay. So usually the local tobacconist also also doubles as a uh, as a as a place where you can mail where you can uh, buy stamps and mail things and pick up packages. Interesting. Your question Interesting. about the pharmacy, I guess we could segue into the healthcare system. Yeah, that, that's very good. Yep. So what's the healthcare system like? Is there a hospital near you? Tell us a little bit about private versus public. Mm-hmm. Well, it's all it's 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 all a private public system. So how health insurance works in the Netherlands is um, it's compulsory when you when you are a legal resident in the Netherlands, you have to have health insurance. You'll be fined if you if you don't have health insurance. And that by but by the same token, it also means that no insurer is allowed to deny you coverage for any reason whatsoever for pre-existing conditions or whatever. They're they're compelled to cover you, even and a, even a private. Well, they're they're all private. So how it works is the front end of the the front end of the healthcare system, the front end of the front end of the health insurance system is private. You have to choose a private insurer. There's about thirty of them. You can comparison shop. I mean, the variations between them is actually limited in terms of actual coverage. They all offer the same core coverage. They're obliged to by law, but they may offer various deals or discounts for accepting a more limited network or something like that. So yeah, none of them is allowed to. Your 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 insurance company doesn't ask you any questions about your pre-existing conditions. They wouldn't be allowed to anyways. They wouldn't be allowed to deny you coverage for that anyways. You just sign up with them and they check. They simply check. They they do want to see a copy of your residence permit if you're a foreigner, which is like a credit card sized biometric ID card that shows that you have the right to live in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. The reason why they ask to see that. And that's that's if you show them that and they type in your your Dutch social security number called you, they'll accept you. But the reason why is because what I, I said is a pu- it's a private public system. The front end is private, and to your private insurance company, you pay a premium of about varying from a hundred to one hundred and forty a month, which sounds like a steal, you know, compared to uh, compared the to US. the USA. And there's an annual annual deductible 
varying from 350 to 850 euros total per year, meaning it's not bad. Yeah, all of your any specialist care you get first comes out of that deductible, so that gets billed back to you in addition to your to your first few premium debits for the year. But once you've burned through that with specialist care or prescriptions or whatever, the rest is completely covered 100%. Visits to the GP, visits to your to your general practitioner are always 100% covered. Hmm. The idea is you should never be afraid to go to your neighborhood doctor. It does have to be your neighborhood doctor. This gets back to the point of walkability. You're actually obliged to choose a GP who is walking distance from where you live Whoa. because they will make a house call if you need it. Wow. If you're, that, if you're that bad off, your doctor will come to your house. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That used to, when I grew up, I mean, when I grew up in New York, and it, it, I think it, they did away with it in the 60s or 70s. But when I grew up, I remember my doctor did house calls, but you'd have to wait all day long for him to show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately for me, I've never, I've never had anything be bad enough that I ever had to, that I ever couldn't make it on my own steam to the to the doctor's office. So where it's actually paid for, I said it's private public, but where of course the cost of it is actually paid for is paid out of your taxes. So obviously, one hundred and forty uh, a month isn't going to be enough for your health insurer to actually cover your actual costs of healthcare, especially if you need specialist care or if you have a chronic condition. But in reality, they claim it back from the government. So the government refuses to pay them unless they can prove that their that their customer has a valid immigration status, because those are the only people who are eligible for insurance. But but it is a sort of it is a managed care system. It can be described by comparison to HMOs in the in the US. US. There's no there's if 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 you if you go directly to a specialist, you'll have to pay for it yourself. I mean, if you really, really, really wanted to like circumvent your GP and insist that you want to go to a specialist or something like that, you wanted to you you want to go to the dermatologist to get that mole lasered off that your GP told you is not cancerous and it's not nothing to worry about, then you have to pay for it. But if you get a referral, then it's paid for. So it's all about getting the referral from your GP. So, and I know we'll talk about visas in just a little bit, how to obtain one. But usually in the U EU, and I know from Spain. One of the requirements are if you're coming over and getting residency, they require you to have health care. And in this case, in Spain's case, they require you at least one year of the private system. But the private system, the problem is they don't accept pre-existing conditions. Mm. Yeah, I think the Netherlands used to have a used to have a system something like that. I can say there is no there is no EU in this area. By the way, this is not a subject of EU law, so it's not. It's sort of I, the EU can be understood by comparison to the U.S. constitutional system. I'm sort of verging into my field of academia. Just like in the U.S., the federal government doesn't doesn't set traffic rules and doesn't 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 regulate every single little thing. The EU also doesn't regulate every single little thing. There's so so the subject of healthcare is not a it's not it's not it's not a it's not an area that the EU is empowered to legislate on. It just happens through the development of Europe after World War II diverging from the way the United States developed is that every every European country has a decent functioning universal okay. healthcare system. But the details of how they work out do vary widely among European countries. So, so there's no conclusions to be drawn about it works this way in Spain, therefore it has to work this way in the Netherlands. Right. I'd say it's, the Dutch system is pretty good. They, the, there's no, there's, there's no catch-22s here. There's it no, sounds awesome. There's, there's nothing in immigration law where they say you have to first get health coverage on your own before we let you into the system. The idea is if you're allowed in, then you're allowed into the system. How close are you to a hospital? Is that walking distance? No, no. The nearest, well, yeah, I mean, you just go, I mean, there's... there's. If you're ill, you're not going to really walk anyway. There's four major hospitals in five major hospitals in Amsterdam. I mean, uh, well, yeah, oh, you mean like, oh, you mean like an emergency room, like if something was really bad. Yeah. Oh, in that sense. I mean, yeah, again, also the, those concepts of like urgent care and stuff like that, like they have like where the, the healthcare system is not so reliant on emergency room treatment as it is in the U.S. 
That is, if it's an if it's a if it's an urgent carish situation, you call your GP. Okay. If it's an urgent carish, you then you're walking to your local your local doctor's office. If it's something like minor minor stitches you need or something like that, that's something you get from your GP. Okay. Or minor burns. They do that. Whatever. What they do stitches, GPs. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, if it was if it was something really small, it was a little. I, I I remember once the last time I went to the GP for an emergency. I was uh, it was one morning I went to the gym and I was just it was one of those days that I was just not in the mood to be there. I was I was like oh god I hate the gym I didn't want to get up early for this, and I was in the locker room and bent over putting something in my gym bag, and I had left the the door to my locker open. Oh, you hit your head! I stood up really. Uh, I stood up and hit the back of my head. Uh, against the point of the door pointing down and my head just just started bleeding like a stuck pig and like like blood like completely matting my matting my hair and they were like the staff was all coming and they were like giving me a towel so i immediately called the gp i said like i'm I'm bleeding i'm bleeding like a stuck pig and so went in she saw me within like five minutes i got on my got on my bicycle and went there i mean i wasn't i wasn't walking distance from the gp anymore but still still mobile enough that i could get on my bicycle and go there you know while, while holding my head and she said, yo, wow. Oh, it's so scary, the oh, blood coming from your head. She said, yeah, she said, oh, well, you know, oh, no, this, no, this will heal. This doesn't need stitches. She said, here, just, she literally said, let's let's actually just, well, how, how did she say? She literally sort of like tied tied some of my hairs into a little knot, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to hold it together. That's so um, funny. That's my one experience with an urgent care uh, situation. If that were on the weekend, what you'd have to do is there's a there's a there's a number you'd call for the for the local the local on duty GP. There'd be like an on duty emergency GP, and they would talk to you on the phone and be like, "Is this bad enough?" And if it is bad enough, they would say, "Okay, come in." And then there's the there's that urgent care GP clinic at one of the local medical centers. So for me, the nearest hospital is well. If it were that bad, I would I would, I would take a taxi. It'd be like an eight minute taxi ride away, I guess. Otherwise, I could get there by bicycle in twenty minutes. Do you think doctors in the hospital, like if you had an emergency, let's say I just moved here from the States Mm -hmm. and I had an emergency, I had to go to the hospital. You think they speak English? Of course they do. Yeah. Yeah. No, especially if somebody's highly educated, if somebody somebody has an academic education in the Netherlands, they have to speak English. I mean, half of the, half of the materials that they would have used to study medicine would have been English medical journal articles in English. That is the international language of science nowadays. So let's let's segue into how to obtain a visa. So and tell us like the different types of visas. I don't believe they have a retirement visa. Is no. that correct? No, yeah. So the Netherlands the, the, the notion of Dutch immigration law is it's based on it's based on the concept of it's based on it's based on the on the, on the precept that the Netherlands is full that there's that there's enough people here already, and so they don't want housing. us. No, not not just there's no. So if you're a non-EU citizen, Dutch immigration law does not provide for any facility just to be able to be here and be self-supporting. They don't care how rich you are. They don't care if you bought a 1.5 million euro canal mansion. They don't care if you say, "Oh, I'm going to be, com- I'm going to, I'm going to be completely self-supporting, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a violence." They don't say, "I don't care." They would say, "Yeah, we don't care. We don't, we don't, we don't want so, you here, like taking up, taking up the scarce housing stock." So the how do? Way, what are the ways? The only, yeah, the only ways are either you're an EU citizen, and EU citizens have freedom of movement. EU citizens are allowed to come here sure. not just for work, but also just to be self-supporting if they want to live here, mm-hmm. or the category of non-EU citizens who's allowed to just move here is there's all now currently there is one harmonized thing in the EU is that all EU countries have a harmonized system for granting permanent residence permit called long-term resident. So if you've got a permanent residence permit in another EU country by living there for five years and usually passing a language exam or something like that, then that does entitle you to move here as an economically inactive person. In that case, if you showed up, if you got the long-term resident status in Italy or in Germany and you showed up here and said, look, I'm, I'm just retired. Here's my pension. Here's 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 a couple 10,000 in savings that I have. They'd be like, okay, sure, that's fine. They would let you stay. In that case, that's allowed. But if you're a non-EU citizen with no connection, or so then the next tier is 
You're a non-EU citizen, but you have a connection to an EU citizen who's living here. Connection family. how? Marriage connection? connection? Yeah, like fa- like family. Yeah, we're talking nuclear family. We're not. We're talking like not not your we're- sister, brother, aunt, uncle, cousin. We're talking. The nuclear family is this is this, this unit that's limited to the partner or spouse, and or your or your child under eighteen of of that unit. And oh. uh, so, if you have so one of those it. family relationships, if you are the child, if you are the minor age child of somebody who legally resides here, or if you are the partner or spouse of an EU citizen legally residing here, you can get a right to stay here. Or if you're the, or if you're the partner or spouse of another non-EU citizen who got a say work related right to be here like so work work related migration this is outside of the field of retirement but you know maybe right. you might still have a few working years well, left well i'm still working thinking, uh, exactly so work related migration is well you know so so yeah, that's either your family member of a new citizen then it's more or less automatic your family member of a dutch citizen your dutch citizen partner has to simply prove that they make enough money to support you. The interesting thing about Dutch immigration law, by the way, as far as that goes, as far as partners or marriage goes, and this is one thing that I'm very proud of, where the Netherlands has always been very progressive, more than anywhere else in the world, is the Netherlands does not require you to get married. There's no requirement to get married, even though, of course, we are the first country in the world to have introduced same-sex marriage in 2001. Even long before that, since the 70s, it has been possible to immigrate to the Netherlands as the unmarried partner in a long-term relationship of either a man or a woman. Like there was, there was already like gay family migration in the Netherlands starting in about 1975. And that's so one of the coolest things. If thing. you're not married, how do you prove that you're in a relationship? Yeah. So then you then it's what's called a de facto, a de facto stable relationship where you simply prove by other means that you share your life with this person, that you Bank are life Bank accounts members. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Bank accounts, leases. Bills. History of travel together, photo albums. Yeah. So you don't have to be legally married, but you have to live with someone or be a partner with someone mm-hmm. outside of the Netherlands to get in? So- yeah. For instance, I mean, if you had a vacation... If let's let's imagine you weren't married. Let's imagine you you had a romance with a Dutch guy that you met in Jamaica, something like that, and and then you dated or you had a long distance relationship and you maintained your relationship with video chatting and you flew back and forth to visit each other and, and you went on you went on vacations together and you could prove plane tickets from that, prove prove that you put an effort into maintaining your relationship and developing it. Then you could get a right to stay in the Netherlands if they want to. If your boyfriend wants to sponsor you, then you can get a right to stay in the Netherlands based on that evidence of a durable and exclusive relationship, relationship. having been built up. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. what I'm really proud of. That I really love. I, that's one thing. I'm I'm very happy being married. I'm extremely happily married. But I'm also glad. I'm also glad that there was no pressure on me and my husband to get married. I of course. I became Dutch through my through my first marriage. Of course, I'm on my second marriage. <laughs> this is, that was the practice one. But uh, I was also very... But I mean, I'm also glad that in Dutch culture, even straight people don't get married a lot of the time. It's, it's some they, People have kids. Straight right. people like it just move in together, have kids, not, buy a house together. Yeah. They don't feel pressure to get married here. There's no, there's no idea of you have to be married to get access to your partner when they're lying in the hospital, for instance. That's one thing that's that's really cool here. That's a big thing. Because here in the States, it's totally opposite. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to be married. You have to show proof that um, that your spouse, you're a spouse. Yeah. I think that goes back to, like, the crazy liability culture in the U.S. Yeah. Like, everyone's afraid of a lawsuit there. Right. And that's one thing that's so refreshing here. So refreshing. That's one thing that's nice. I can, I can also, from my lawyer's perspective, I can say about this is where a different legal system really makes a difference. And the fact that there's no crazy lawsuit culture here that doesn't exist. There's none of that fear of liability. None of that. And so that doesn't, that also keeps to, that also makes it that certain prices don't get driven up due to, due to liability uh, related 
reasons. But that was one cool. I mean, that's it's not my field of the law that most that I'm most passionate about. Torts. I had torts my first semester of uh, Dutch law school. I was like, oh god, this is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But torts is what we call it. That's what the, the notion of liability of suing somebody for the damages they caused you. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, I mean, the most valuable lesson, first semester of law school, you learn in Dutch law school that liability is limited to the actual damages you suffered. The actual financial, put a, put a euro sign on what, the, what is the actual financial damage that you suffered. That's the most you can get out of somebody who injured you or or, or or wronged you in some way. There's no punitive damages. There's no pain and suffering damages. It would literally be, you crashed into my car. I had to pay 3,500 euros to get the body work done. That's what I get out of right. it, liability. So getting back to visas. So bottom line really is the only ways to get into the Netherlands would well, be yeah, so, from somebody so living there. Yeah, I always like I always like to build up dramatic dramatic tension. Be like, sort of, first clear the clear out the notions that you'll be welcome here simply because you have money. Clear out the notion that you're just that you're welcome to, to rock up. Clear out the notion, but 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 I'll but I will say if you are lucky enough to have a partner who's established here, that's a nice way mm-hmm. to come. Immigrating for love is a, is a good way to do it. But if you don't have that. If you're two non-EU citizens who are married to each other and neither of you has a connection to the Netherlands and you want to move here, what can you do? For U.S. citizens, there is one very, very, very nice facility that does allow you to kind of move here on your own steam without being sponsored by an employer. Work-related migration, by the way, means typically being sponsored by an employer who wants to pay you a high salary. If you're recruited by a big corporation here like Philips or Heineken, Mm-hmm. And they want to pay you a salary over seventy thousand a year, of course. Then, that, then that's taken care of. Don't let me. Then, yeah. Then, then you'll then you'll be allowed it for that for that for the purpose of that job. And you have to toe the line. You have to toe the line with your employer, or always make sure to find an employer who pays you enough for five years until you can finally get your permanent residence permit, and then you can just be yourself. That's that's so, how that's how it always works. You always have to your your first five years in the Netherlands are, are always your probationary period in immigration law. You always have to like totally so that means jump through the hoop of whatever condition is on your stay for five years before you get your independent right of stay. So, so if I get if I get my per- seventy thousand dollar job and I get laid off, mm-hmm. like didn't that then happen you to find, you? Then you better find a new employer. Then you better find a new employer. Yeah, that happened to me. I I came here as a work related migrant. And the, the company went bankrupt two weeks after I arrived. That was my first my my first residence permit was work related. I had to really scramble to find I had to scramble to find a new employer right away. Uh, otherwise, they go, get they let you it go was, back. It was they gone. Yeah. you back. So yeah, 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 exactly. And but you know, so I'm just so so if you're not lucky enough to be an EU citizen, if you're not lucky enough to already have a long term resident permit from another EU country, if you're not lucky enough to have a partner who's an EU citizen. And if you're not lucky enough to have a partner who himself or herself has a residence permit for work that can sponsor you, or you're not lucky enough to yourself be sponsored for work, what is your option? Well, if you're a U.S. citizen, have I got news for you? There is a treaty that the Netherlands somewhat unwittingly signed with the United States in 1956 called the Dutch-American Friendship Treaty. And this was part of a sort of friendship offensive that the U.S. was going on. It was the Cold War. The U.S. was trying to sign these treaties with as many countries as possible to sort of outcompete the Soviet Union on the charm offensive. And you look at this treaty nowadays, and most of it is really anodyne. Most of it is just sort of like, oh, we're going to be friends, and we'll have free trade with each other, and nationals of one signatory state will have freedom of speech and freedom of religion when they're on the territory of the other one. There's all this sort of obvious stuff. But in the 90s, Dutch immigration lawyers dusted off this treaty and they discovered that there was a really interesting provision in it and said that that each signatory state, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the United States of America, was obliged to allow citizens of the other country to legally reside in their territory for the purpose of developing and running a business in which they have invested a substantial amount of capital. And what makes the Netherlands so attractive for U.S. citizens relying on this provision of the treaty is that the notion of a substantial amount of capital has not been revised since 1956. 
Wow. So what was a lot of money in 1956, 10,000 Dutch guilders is now 4,500 euros. So it means any U.S. citizen who starts any kind of business in the Netherlands, even if it's a little freelance operation, even if it's a little DBA, and they can invest 4,500 euros in their business, meaning put it in your business, don't take it out. It's sort of, you see it as a deposit. Mm-hmm. I always describe it as like a game of bowling. Like when you go to the bowling alley and you put down a $20 deposit on your bowling shoes, it means if you run out of money, you can't go back and say, well, I'll hand in the shoes. You give me back my twenty my, my twenty dollars so I can pay for a few more games of bowling. No, that's it, then it's game over. But the idea is you're putting a forty five hundred euro deposit, so to speak, on your on your residence permit by making it it makes it that your business always has a reserve if it goes bankrupt, but that it can pay off its debtors with. But based on that, um, the treaty says that means then that the Dutch government is obliged to give you a residence permit for the purpose of being an entrepreneur without subjecting you to the normal requirement of Dutch immigration law of having to prove what the added value is of your business to the Dutch economy. And that's a really big, that's a really big privilege because normally to get a residence permit as an entrepreneur here, it's really hard. It's wow. really about like demonstrating what is the concrete interest of the Dutch economy that you're serving with that business? What is the unique selling point that you have? What do you have going on that nobody else, no other business here is offering? But with the Dutch American Friendship, a U.S. citizen is exempt. And then the U.S. citizen's spouse will get a right to stay here. No questions asked. And the U.S. citizen's children will get the right to stay here. No questions asked. So, so let's that is say, the... So let's say I have a business where to gaze retire. And I put in $5,000 in my software, all the, the, everything that my computer equipment, my microphone, all my monthly stuff. Mm -hmm. And I get my income is from people. If I have a subscription or something Mm -hmm. like that. So that's a a viable Mm -hmm. possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's best to make the investment in the form of cash, of course, because yeah. your microphone and your laptop depreciate. Right. If you spend exactly 4,500 euros on a brand new microphone, a brand new laptop, well, guess what? Next month, it's not worth 4,500 euros anymore. Okay. It's already lost value. So that's not the best way to make your make your investment. The best way is just to put in cash. cash, put the cash in the bank, in a bank account belonging to your business and leave it there about maintaining that level of I like that I like that little loophole mm-hmm. yeah it's a loophole but of course I all, and and it's 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 not for everybody though there's some people they they say wow how is it so easy and I say yeah really I mean but yes, it's not really, really easy. It, I can get it for you if you have 4500 euros and if you have a US passport I can get you this residence permit but I have to like often the people who doesn't work out for are the people who turn out not to be really dyed in the wool entrepreneurs who don't have, when it doesn't work out with their business and they come to me and they say, Hey, can I pick up a job on the side working at a bookshop or working at a restaurant? No, that's not allowed. It's one it has big to be your business. I'd be working for yourself. And does that, Oh, so you have to do that for at least five years to become a permanent resident. Yeah. And then after that five year period, can you like retire? If you, yeah, exactly. If you if you applied for the permanent residence permit, right, which typically requires you to pass a Dutch exam. Mm-hmm. So that's why I would say from day one, right. make an effort to learn. Yeah, don't expect that you'll pick it up. Normally, you would have to. So you after five years, you would have to pass that exam, or within the five years, you pass the exam, and at the five year point, you prove, look, I passed the exam, and I have sufficient stable resources to support myself which is actually not that much. And that's, mm-hmm. that's considered to be about 2000 a month for a couple. Yeah. Then you'll get a permanent residence permit. And then you can completely retire. Hmm. Sounds really good. <laughs> it sounds really good, yeah. Jeremy. So let's, how about the tax structure while we're on like the immigration visa, the tax structure, do I, I know I have to pay us taxes. So if I come over, right. And then do I pay U.S. taxes well, and not- have to pay Netherlands taxes? Yeah, well, let me start off by explaining. A lot of U.S. citizens are really surprised to find out that 
that the U.S. is the oddball in the world. They think it's the most normal thing in the world that a country charges its citizens taxes wherever they live in the world. And nobody does that. Nobody else does that in the world except for Eritrea. The United States and Eritrea are the only two countries in the world that have citizenship-based taxation. So we'll start off with that. We'll start off with the, 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 the U.S. Is the, odd, is the oddball in the world. So the U.S. is the... So that said, when you're a U.S. citizen living abroad, so you do have to file U.S. taxes. That said, most of the time, your obligation to actually pay U.S. taxes is mitigated. The U.S. has what's called avoidance of double taxation agreements with most countries in the world, including the Netherlands. So how that works out in practice is the IRS offers one of two avoidance of double taxation schemes. It's either you file your U.S. taxes and you say, look, I earned less than, I don't know, it's 130,000 U.S. dollars last year. And you say, look, I wasn't in the U.S. You have to fill in all the dates that you entered and left the U.S. to prove that you were there for less than, I don't know how many, 100 180 days. I'm a human rights lawyer, not a tax lawyer. So nobody, right. nobody sue me. Nobody sue me in a U.S. court. For, it's hypothetical. Uh, for, for, yeah, exactly. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm giving as, I'm admitting as a lawyer, this is not my field of, of actual expertise. Okay. So that's fine. No one can, uh, no one can get that pain and suffering uh, damages <laughs> out of me in a New York court, especially in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so it's either you earn less than a certain amount, 130K, mm-hmm. and you say to the IRS, look, I don't live in the US, I live, I live in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. And they say, okay, good, and then you're exempt. You, you owe us nothing, thanks for filing. Or it's you earn more than that amount, and you say, but I don't live in the US, I live in the Netherlands. And so you say, I earned X, and I paid Y in Dutch taxes, but if I lived in the U.S., I would have paid Z in U.S. income taxes. So they subtract they, su- they subtract Y from Z. And then it, obviously, if it's negative, it's not like you get money back. But they'll say, okay, then it's zero. You, you paid more taxes in the Netherlands than you would have paid in U.S. taxes. Therefore, your net, what, you, what you owe us net is zero. So do, do I pay Netherlands taxes first? And yeah. then, and so then, the Netherlands, yeah, the Netherlands is a modern country. The Netherlands is a normal country in the world, which means it's a it's a residence based tax system. Whoever lives in the Netherlands pays such taxes. Whoever lives in the Netherlands is domiciled, for all intents and purposes, in the Netherlands and has to pay Dutch income tax. So you so you would pay that first, and then you would file your U.S. taxes you know, based on that. But what, yeah, taxes is another reason that people say to me, oh, can it be really that easy to move to the Netherlands? I'm like, well, first you got to decide that you're willing to be restricted to only working in self-employment. Second of all, there's things about the Dutch tax system that really scare a lot of Americans, especially a lot of wealthy Americans. Um, it's one thing to look into, yes. It's one thing to look into. You've got to talk to a tax lawyer here. Mm-hmm called a fiscalist. You gotta talk to a tax lawyer and talk about what your maximal maximum exposure would be to the Dutch tax system because it's yeah, you're gonna pay more taxes than you're used to in the US. I mean, right. Most this is one of these interesting things where the board the border lines between between progressive and conservative are very are very different here. A lot of Americans That's who think because of themselves of the as progressive too. Yeah, a lot of Americans who think of themselves as progressive if they're wealthy They'll be at the conservative end of the Dutch spectrum if they if they come here and they are upset about how much they get taxed. Okay. A lot of that's unfortunately the legacy of Reagan, that and Clinton. You know that that in the U.S. it's it's become seen as indispensable to become wealthy because of course you have to if you if you if you don't want to end up destitute because there's no safety net. And so a lot of a lot of normal. I do I do see this in my practice. A lot of people who think of themselves as normal. I'm, I'm only wealthy because I had to be. I had to save this money. I had to put this all in my 401k. They're shocked when they move here and they find out there's a wealth tax. That's one thing that's really shocking for wealthy. I looked Americans. into that in Spain too. There yeah, is a wealth tax. tax. There's wealth, an inheritance your, tax, you know. and wealth tax is based upon global assets. Mm-hmm. So not just not just capital gains. But it's, you're literally taxed on the Global. value of your assets that are just sitting somewhere. Right. Yep. So, and the difference is also U.S. wealthy people usually don't pay taxes because there's so many loopholes. And 
that's probably how they become wealthy. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's besides the point. But in in the EU, in, you get services for your taxes. Mm -hmm. So you pay taxes and Social Security all your life, and you get health care, which is not a privilege. You get all of those services, whereas mm -hmm. we probably pay less taxes and get less services. So... Yes, you really get you get something for it. You get right. something that's worth it. But uh, yeah, you're gonna be yeah. It's living here is expensive. I mean, how? Yeah, oh, oh, no, I'll scrap that to the point. What was I gonna say? Yeah, just the, the quality of infrastructure. Right. The fact there's no right. potholes it's, in the road. The fact the public transit works. Yes. So, are there any cons living in Amsterdam or the Netherlands in general, as opposed to living in the U.S., Pittsburgh, or anywhere else? Well, I'm, I haven't moved back yet. That's, I mean, I'm testimonial to it. I mean, I, I go back. It's fun seeing friends. It's, there's, there are places, there are places in the world that are more exciting than Amsterdam. Amsterdam is still, it's still a small city. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of sleepy city in its own way. It has its exciting pockets. It has a really good, it's got, it's a decent, decent queer scene. Really, really cool underground stuff. That's my, that's my thing. A lot of good, a lot of good underground dance parties. A lot of good, like. Nice nightclubs where you can go all night for, mm -hmm. for a nice queer party on the edge of the city. We do that well here, but it's a, but it's still a small city. You have to keep in mind it's a small city. It's it's sleepy in a certain way. It's not. It definitely doesn't stack up to the to the to the mega cities of the world. It doesn't stack up in terms of excitingness to the Berlins and the Londons and the New Yorks of the world. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a small small city. It's um and got it cons. Mm -hmm. Cons, yeah. I mean, other cons. I mean, for me, it's it's nice. I love I love having government services. I love having things being taken care of. I love knowing there's a social safety net, and I'm willing to take the things that come in exchange for that. Not just that you, not just that you pay taxes, but also that the government is up in your shit here in ways that people would not believe in the U.S. It's like the one. Of the, it's I I liken it. I liken it to living in a gated community, like mm -hmm. the gated communities in the U.S. where the mm -hmm. homeowners association has is all up in your business about yeah. what color you paint your house and yeah. what kind of Christmas decorations you're allowed to put out. That's the entire Netherlands. Wow. The entire Netherlands is zoned out the wazoo. You, if you, there's, there's, there's this notion of even if you own a property, you're not, you're not. You're not just free to do with it whatever you want. You have to, if you if you even want to like build, if you if you want to build so much as like a little a little extra window in your roof. See, you can see across the street from you. See the sort of tiled roof. Yeah, there. you have to if get you, permission. If you own one of the if you own one of those apartments and you wanted to like break through the roof to build a little Eve Eve style window sticking out, you would have to ask the the local planning commission. They might say no. They might say this that doesn't that doesn't fit into the look of uh, of this neighborhood. That doesn't fit into the architectural style. Uh, if you have an older house, if you have a house that's, that has monumental status, where it's like 150 or 200 years old, you're really limited in the things you're allowed to do. You're not even so much as allowed to like put a nail in the wall to hang up a, a painting in your own wow. in your own apartment. If it's monumental status, you, you're, then you're not allowed to damage that stuff. You have to you have to suspend. You would have to suspend your painting from like a, find a find a wood beam in the ceiling and suspend it from there. When I first moved here, I put out my trash on the wrong night. And at that time, there was still. Nowadays, there's the the trash is done really nicely in Amsterdam. They've got these underground containers where you drop you drop your Spain your general trash in there whenever you want, and you also have like there's a, there's a glass container and a paper container. Right you for recycling. You can take your trash out whenever you want nowadays. But when I first moved here, there were certain pickup days for every neighborhood. And if you put your trash out on the wrong day, somebody from the city from the municipality would come along. They'd grab that trash bag. They would take it back to whatever uh, secret secret police headquarters were <laughs> tear open tear open your trash bag wearing gloves and look for anything with your name and address on it and then send you a fine fine like 100 euros for putting oh out your, putting out your trash on the wrong day big brothers watching mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in wrapping up jeremy what would you say to our audience if they're considering relocating to amsterdam like you did I would say understand that understand that Amsterdam's crowded. Understand that Amsterdam has limited housing stock. Understand that do please learn Dutch. 
please learn Dutch and ring your neighbor's doorbells and get to know them because there is there is generally getting to be a feeling that Amsterdam has has become overrun with quote unquote expats. And so realize that it is a wonderful city to live in. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world, but there is there is resentment. The 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 <laughs> people one one newspaper column called uh, called expats moving into sort of formerly working class neighborhoods of Amsterdam that used to have a lot of social cohesion where everybody knew each other people moving in those neighborhoods they're, they're called pokemon zombies based on all their neighbors ever see them doing is like down the street staring at their google maps or staring at their phone following their social media and uh, I'm going into their going into their apartment and coming out again while still staring at their screens. But anyway, Jeremy, and we're going to wrap it up now. And I just want to thank you so much for doing this and taking the time to twice to meeting you and now doing the podcast. It was a pleasure learning so much about Amsterdam and the Netherlands. And thank you again so much. Thank you for having me on here. It was nice to nice to talk about it. Nice to share something about life and what I think is the yeah. best city in the world. To be really honest. my really my pleasure. So thank you again, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Where Do Gays Retire podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast. And consider making a donation by clicking the coffee cup on any page at www.wheredogaysretire.com. Each cup of coffee that you buy costs $5 and goes towards helping us continue the podcast. Thank you for your continued support. <laughs>